All right, so tonight we are going to be reflecting upon redefining your relationship with work. Brain Club, of course, is our education program designed to provide education about neurodiversity and more than that, to bring people together based on a shared vision of what's possible and to contribute to systems change by shifting social norms, by learning together, unlearning together, promoting new ways of thinking and being. Of course, this is uh, not for medical or mental health advice. It's not a support group. All Brains Belong has programs like this, but uh, this one's an education program. It's not a place to discuss or solve individual specific problems or process trauma. And it's also not a neurodivergent affinity space. We welcome everyone here, um, anyone here coming to learn and unlearn. You can participate however you are most comfortable. As many of you have figured out, if you've been here a while, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we do not expect anything of you. So feel free to walk and move or fidget or stim or eat, take breaks, whatever you need. And um, you're welcome to communicate in whatever form you are most comfortable. Um, there'll be a portion of tonight a brain club with a pre-recorded panel that'll run a, a little over 20 minutes. So during that time, we'll we'll have the the chat is the way that you can communicate. But after after that, you're welcome to use mouth words or type in the chat. Um, direct messaging or private messaging is also enabled, so you're welcome to send messages and questions that way too. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity. Um, we prioritize safety and the, the needs of the collective. So giving space for others to process. And, um, you know, we try our best to navigate what we call conflicting access needs. The idea that we all have different brains, we all have different needs, but and inevitably those needs are going to conflict from time to time. Access needs being, of course, um, anything that anyone needs for full and meaningful participation. We talk a lot about access needs here at Brain Club. So uh, speaking of which, uh, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. But if not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. And you can do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. And that's my visual support to actually open the chat because I always forget. Speaking of the chat, the chat is a great example of conflicting access needs. Um, there are many brains um, that find the chat to be a really important accommodation to be able to communicate without mouth words. Also to be able to like get your thoughts out as soon as they come to mind. Um, also to like have the conversation not necessarily happen to have happen like right here. So you have a, a thought and it like maybe takes a few minutes to percolate and then you have something to share. So the chat is a way of doing that. And of course that more people can, can share ideas than would possibly have time to speak out loud. Um, it's also a way of directly engaging with fellow community members and to meet people that way and to even make arrangements to continue your conversations offline. On the flip side, there are lots of brains, maybe even the same brains, uh, for whom the chat can be really distracting. And like sometimes there's this startle response when it pops up and sometimes it moves really fast and it can be really visually cluttering. So yeah, this is a great example of conflicting access needs. Um, so um, our suggestions for navigating conflicting access needs, because a lot of people talk about this, um, it, after you see a chat pop up and it's bothering you, um, try not closing the window. Um, this way, when more chat messages come, it'll replace the old messages, but won't have the pop-up thing. Um, there's also this thing called uh, chat preview. You can turn it off. There's a little up carrot next to the chat window. You click on that little upward facing triangle thing and click on the word no chat previews and that checkbox will go away. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, and last thing about the chat, still talking about the chat. Um, if we're gonna use the chat, we just ask that you just type in the main box instead of using the reply threads. You can certainly tag a person with by, by typing the at symbol and their name if you wanna get their attention, but the re reply thread thing has people's like bouncing up and down on the chat. Okay, I'm done. So we are continuing our 
February 2024 theme of connection is the path to health. So um, when we think about um, all of the different ways, all of the different domains of life that contribute to health, like work is a place where we spend a lot of time. And for a lot of people, work does not work for our brains. And that's why um, we talk about employment a lot here at, at All Brains Belong. What we know is that uh, autistic and ADHD adults are far more likely to struggle with employment. Um, depending on what study you read, autistic adults are two and a half to eight times more likely to be unemployed or underemployed. 75% of ADHDers experience employment related challenges. And what we know is that employment and health are related in both directions. What we don't want and what we have far too often is the square peg that is hammered to fit into the round hole. It's like shoving, you know, like society shoves people into containers that do not work. And what happens, you break the peg. You know, when we think about all of the different types of access needs that play out in work, whatever type of employment scenario someone is in or not in, um, when work does not work, it is often because of unmet access needs. And when we think about all of the different ways that humans are othered in this society, um, you know, if you are othered for aspects of race or gender or sexuality or class or, you know, any of it, and then that intersects with having your access needs thwarted, and um, your disability or your neurodivergence, um, we have a lot of people that are left out of a lot of things. What we know is that social inequity um, plays out and impacts everything. This is a really busy slide, but the concept being that when we think about access to basic needs in society, um, uh, having access to employment um, is is like can can is a has a really huge impact on on all of it. And before we begin talking about relationship with work, I don't think we can talk about relationship with work uh, 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 without talking about class um, and everything that goes into class and class culture. So class uh, defined by uh, Kessel and Burkfield in Parenting for Social Justice, you know, one of our favorite books here at Brain Club, um, with the idea that there is relative social hierarchy um, ranking in terms of income, wealth, status, power. Um, different people have different access to resources. So the combination of access to resources, um, you know, your relationship to work, whether you're respected, whether you belong, whether you have power, um, to do what needs doing in your life. And then, of course, as I, as I mentioned, um, the intersectionality of all the different um, identity characteristics that also come to impact um, access to resources. Um, and so um, these prompts um, from the team at Think Again Training and Consulting, um, relationship to work has many things. Why do we work? How do we feel or think we should feel about our work? Maybe the relationship between paid work and other parts of life. The, the emotional relationship to the economic system, the economic system being capitalism and depending on, you know, all kinds of factors um, that you, you may have a different, different relationship to the economic system. Maybe what's even been modeled about work for you, even in early childhood when we're laying down our initial beliefs about the world. And I mentioned again, these intersectional factors. So um, for the next 20 minutes or so, we are going to hear from some of our community members. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, it, what, what we've done is we've taken um, perspectives and experiences, we've um, intermixed them. Um, and and I, think, I think we'll hear some, some uh, familiar themes, but also some, some differences ac across people's experiences. And then we'll have plenty of time for conversation afterwards. So David, take it away. Hi 
I really think we need to reimagine work. The system tells you that your value comes from what you produce, which is of course bogus. You know, the more productive you are, the whatever, and like the idea of like work, work mm -hmm. has become so removed from, I don't know, meaning, purpose, identity, and like it doesn't need to be those things, but for some people it is those things and there's this, you know, tension. So I don't know, for, for you, um, I'd love to know how do you personally define the concept of work? It's interesting because my definition of work has changed. So I started working when I was 17 at a answering service. And from there, um, I loved it. I loved talking to people. I liked that I wasn't in front of them. Um, I enjoyed that part. And I, from there, went into a sales position. Um, and I really, I liked that. It was a little bit harder to like deal with people, but I found that I was really good with computers. I had already taken some computer classes in school. So I really got into into technology. People are like on this, like this path of like, this is your menu of options in your life. And like, you pick one of them. Anyway, in an ideal world, how do you enter the workforce? Hmm. Entering the workforce, there is to an extent a leap. You have to start somewhere. So the company that I worked for, they sold cell phones. So I had my first cell phone um, while I was working there. And I, I did stay in sales for a little while. I even sold cars, um, but it was hard having that face to face. And I was really horrible at breaking the ice. It was very challenging for me to like talk about interesting things, I guess, for people. And then I would, I would hyper like think about that. And then it would make me even more isolated. <laughs> and you're in that plot process of exploring and reflecting. So finding something that feels like it matches your identity, your needs, your values, but accepting that there will be a level of compromise. I mean, work is work. People work ideally not just for the paycheck, but part of it is because there's a paycheck. My upbringing, my father was a, a sales uh, rep and he worked really, really hard. He didn't have a high school diploma. And he was like a hero to me because he worked so hard for our family. Um, and it wasn't easy because he, I could see the struggle that he had. And my mother was always like, um, maybe not quite an executive assistant, but pretty close to that. And she had really good work ethic. Um, that's what I thought I was supposed to do. You know, I thought that I was supposed to find this job and that I would just be really good at it. And, you know, it would be amazing. It was hard. As kitchens tend to attract multiply marginalized people, because I've been in a lot of kitchens with other trans folks, with other neurodivergent folks, where it's like, okay, so these expectations are built around cis bodies and a one neurotype. <laughs> um, and my body actually can't <laughs> be here yeah. for 12 hours. <laughs> Um, otherwise I start having heart palpitations. <laughs> Healthy employment relationship is like all relationships, families, friends, romantic. It, it should be bi-directional. You should be putting something in, but also getting something back. So as you're exploring different types of work and ways to integrate into the workforce, be careful to not only as be assessing yourself, but be assessing the, the context and how you perform in that context. And also what those employers offer um, and, and how they create fit as well. It's, it's, there's two sides to that. And often it's all too easy to go internal and take all the responsibility. It worked or didn't work because of me, but that's not really how it is. And then, and then you add on top of that, the personal life stressors um, that, that um, can come up and any of those things, uh, one can have difficulty. I can have difficulty managing, become dysregulated. Um, the hyper-focus means that I tend to get and stay distracted from work. Those are all stressors. And then once I get like any of those stressors, you know, that, that can start to lead that, that it goes unresolved can lead to, it really gets me into a, a, a vicious cycle of a, a dysregulation spiral. So I get, I get stressed out. I get anxious. Um, that which leads to mental and physical tension. I go into defensive behaviors, worry, self-protective avoidance, distraction, 
Um, there's dysregulation, including sleep, which leads to less capacity for attention, less capacity for motor skills and motor planning, less executive functioning, which then can lead to more and bigger mistakes, um, hyperfocus, getting stuck on the wrong details, self-justification, externalizing blame, attacking perceived sources of threat all of which go over really well in a work environment, leading to more fit, more negative feedback, possible discipline, job loss, bad reviews that limit my potential to advance and my potential for access to organizational power and privilege that could actually help me fix the problems that are affecting me. The idea of shifting social norms through community connection with this vision of like, what what like can i rethink some things in my life that aren't working for me or maybe are working for me and can i learn about my access needs in that way it was really hard for me to get into that social place of like knowing how to interact with people in the office and then also how to break away and do my job if i was having trouble i'm very good with routine so you know you give me a spreadsheet or a word document like i know how to write a letter i'm very good with um, grammar but if it was out of that wheelhouse that would be a lot more challenging for me and, and that's when i started to notice a lot more i mean i had already noticed differences growing up but i didn't really like what i was doing when we think about work in terms of like meaningful occupation, often like the meaningfulness of that is kind of left out. I think the most important thing is to build that framework of assessing and reflecting. I think I like these things. I think these are important characteristics. I think this is my identity and then exploring it and reflecting on how you responded, but not holding yourself to a very specific definition of who you are or what your identity is or what's important because that will change over time. So it's more about having that framework to explore it than it is to identify yourself. And it'll continue to change throughout adulthood. So it's that it's about having a structure to reflect and assess and explore more so than it is like figuring it out. Because just as you figure it out, we are people and we are dynamic and we change. And at a young age, I realized, well, we're working because we have to, so that we live this life, so that we have cars, we can buy clothes, we can have a house. Because that's all I was thinking. Like, I'm supposed to, you know, make this so much money at whatever age. I'm supposed to have children at this age, and I'm supposed to have a house. Like, there's this timeline that I'm supposed to follow, and it was very challenging for me. And I'd always be like, why? Why do I have to do this? And it's, it, it's not working for me. Like what is supposed to happen isn't happening. And I would tell people, I'm like, we're working because we have to, but if we didn't have to, would we be working? What, how do you define work? What does work mean to you? Like this starts so much earlier than entering the workforce. An important consideration for work that it is often overlooked is how it matches a person's individual values. And that can happen in a lot of ways. You can directly approach a value, like I like helping other people and work in human services. But I think sometimes we, we fall short at expanding that definition. If you like helping people, you can also work in retail or in customer service. Uh, so overlaying what your values are with what the job is, and how it feels and and operates practically so part of that is assessing your values and those will change over time and there's no right and wrong values necessarily so it's there's a level of self-understanding in that exploration and i use exploration intentionally because work can be a way to explore those values or how to tap into them. I think it's very often we talk about like, like what we do like for work rather than who we are and the gifts we have to offer to our communities. So being able to share our gifts, sometimes our gifts might be tied to the work that we do, but sometimes our gifts are not tied that we could be artists, we can be we can be other things in our lives that often don't get to be shared in our workplace or in our communities. I think people don't realize that maybe they're really good at doing something, right? But they don't enjoy it, but it's what they do and they're getting money doing this. But at the end of the day, they're just like, 
that wasn't a fulfilling day. I could see really drilling into what are the benefits of workplaces and the benefits of being a worker and who are those benefits for and who are they not for? Like how are things by design right now, either working or not working? Um, Where are those gaps in our, um, in in the safety nets that support workers or that could support everyone? But I, I, this is where I start to think about, we we talk about benefit cliffs, we talk about the, sort of the, the, it, that increasing space where workers are earning more but not having uh, safety nets that keep pace um, and therefore in, in, in an unintended consequence of actually taking people out of work, right? The idea right. of like, we want people to be in the workplace, but if they don't have the supports they need for stability in their housing and stability in their health care, they will only work so much where they can't keep working and they yep. will come back out because that's how they get their basic needs met and the resources they rely on. And that's a stuck place for a lot of people who, who would like to be unstuck. Like a lot of people work in areas that tend toward exploitation and dehumanization um and some of those folks are like i'm just doing this until like i make it in a creative field i'm just doing this until i am finished with this certification that's going to let me do this job that i really care about and some people are like i've been forced to do this because of racism because of classism and discrimination and hiring practices so on and so forth And some of us are there because we want to be and because we think that it's important that people do those jobs and that whether you are working a job that tends towards exploitation and dehumanization or you in your day to day life are profiting from other people working those jobs, whether it's buying your coffee at a coffee shop that a barista makes or like going to the grocery store where someone is stocking the shelves. um, Those are jobs that like are inherently like full of dignity, like that work matters on a fundamental level and is important and is noble and like even if you want to do it being treated poorly doing those kinds of jobs can really weigh on you and like it's important that you're doing that work whether you continue to do it or not it's you should be proud of it we all all people to an extent want to contribute something and, and 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 offer and help in some way, uh, you might want to find a way to meet that psychological need through your work where you can contribute and, and, and help others. Or you may have robust opportunities outside of work where you don't need to use work to balance that. The idea of like a person growing up over time and this idea of like, more like a holistic transition that starts way earlier of this path, this path to thriving, right? Like, like, can you, can you, can you talk about that? For me, thriving, flourishing is the goal, whether it's at work personally, honestly, it's, it's about personal flourishing and thriving and how does work contribute to that? And it can do it in different ways. Is it helping you expand your boundaries or push your horizons, or is it reinforcing a strength and in, in, in some part of your identity and how you self-identify? Does it give you community? Uh, Does it expose you to new community? Yeah, I think that's really important because I think a lot of times it's like accidental how your path evolves, like the experiences you have, um, the people you're around, whether it's, whether these experiences are, are affirming, like even, I mean, there are people, I mean, let's even think about you know, transition age youth, right? Like, so this idea of, you know, you make it to middle school and you're like, I don't know. I don't, do I even really know what I like? Do I know what I like? Do I know what I dislike? Do I know what's even important to me? I don't know, because there's all these social pressures that say conform, conform. And the bigger picture, the bigger, like the, like this, the, the, the systems that you are in are explicitly training you to conform and comply. And like, that is so counter to this idea of this individualistic thriving, I think. Often um, 
there are jobs, roles, positions out there that don't name our gifts, but that we have the offer that would be beneficial to our communities. And so we call that opportunity creation, where we take people's gifts and create opportunity for that, for them to maybe possibly make a living out of that thing and be able to thrive. Tell me, what, is, what does that look like? That sounds incredible. Oh, uh, so I'll give you, I'll give you a really great example and uh, I'll just, I mean, I think I can name names. I don't, I don't think she would mind at all, but I'll, I'll, I'll name the names because I think it's an excellent recent example of opportunity creation, which we have many. So Anna, Anna is a, um, a Latina woman in the state of Vermont who, um, when we were trying to do, not trying, when we were putting together a BIPOC financial wellness empowerment program, she had some expertise uh, in this area. And so we, along with another individual, Shonda, uh, were able to create um, a financial 101, 102, 103 financial wellness series for BIPOC people through the intellectual, through the vision of the root, but the intellectual property of these individuals and be able to share that in an affinity space with BIPOC to help um, lift them up in their financial literacy, wellness, awareness, and education. Through that program, we then created another program that was a BIPOC-centered um, home buyers program where we prioritized BIPOC people and their partners to being able to have the information skills and resources that they need to buy homes because if we know the history of BIPOC people trying to own homes <laughs> there are still racist policies that are on the books that prevent us from being able to access resources that maybe other people who are who are not of color can access so through this we partnered with Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust one of our local um affordable housing agencies here in southern Vermont and ultimately be through relationship and through those gifts that Anna held, we were able to hire her for this program. And she was able to develop a full program for her own ideas of, of what this looked like uh, through her own trainings, through her own awareness, through her own experiences and create a curriculum for um, this home buyers um, program with collaboration with the root, with collaboration from Winder and Housing Trust, where we served over 20 BIPOC households in this um, programming. This now has turned into, now Anna is employed by Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust, and she is starting the BIPOC financial empowerment program that is her own gifts that will go that will carry throughout the state providing these um tools and resources and awareness to primarily our BIPOC communities and so not only did she get to share her gifts she got to make connections and relationships and she got got to be paid what she is worth for and valued for who she is and this is just as one example of many opportunity creations that we've been able to create specifically prioritizing BIPOC communities. An incredible story. So you really, it's, it, it's like, um, it's no, it's identifying the strengths of individuals within your community and investing in them. Not only are they serving the, like you're investing in them, they are investing in the community and you've created like together, you've created something that didn't exist before. Um, do you have any advice for people who are stuck in a workplace culture? Because they have also been taught, like, you get a job, you do the thing, you know, so you can do the things, right? Um, like right. advice for people who they like, they know they need freedom, they know they need autonomy, but like they, they don't imagine they could possibly start their own thing. Right. Hope has always been what's driven me. And I have always thought that if there was opportunity and you might not have it right now, it might not even be tomorrow. The job that I had before we started Limelight Restoration, 
I decided to be a little different with my resume. Um, and I'm very good with resumes. And it was always like, you know, you put wh where you worked and then all the stuff that you did. And I'm like, but I do so much more than that. Like I, I have way more to offer than just office stuff, right? So on my resume, um, I put that I can run heavy equipment. I can, uh, I drive four wheelers. Like I put all of my like country girl side on my resume on purpose. It's incorporating so many of my personal interests that I like. So what I have to say with where people are maybe feeling stuck and they're unhappy because they're doing the thing that they think they're good at and that's all they're good at. What do you do when you're not at work? What could you put on your resume? Because those are skills. You don't have to have a job that says you can do this. If, if you're a great seamstress or you're good at, you know, marketing stuff and making things, I think that there's a different way of looking at jobs that you may have not thought you were qualified for. If you look at it as an overall picture of what you can provide. When I have gone for interviews in the past, um, when I was younger, it was so intimidating and scary. As I got older, I learned that they're interviewing me for the job, but I'm also interviewing them because I don't know if I want to work here. I've been let go before. I have had people not like me stand up for myself and I didn't want to work for a company where I didn't have a voice because I have a lot to say. And I, you know, I think that people should not be afraid to tell their employer what they need or that they're sick or that they can't come in. It's We're caught in systems that we prop up that we have to, to navigate and cobble together and we think the system is bigger than us, but the system, but the, that really that it's us. Like we are the ones that have a uh, a role in this, and we we can disrupt it. Yes, and I think like you know, like we were talking about this morning with like email, like all the chaos that comes in, right? Like so, you have to you have to be able to have the the spaciousness yes. to zoom out to reimagine, <laughs> and when you're like in the weeds, in the chaos, you can't even do that so you like stick to the systems because it preserves your bandwidth even though that known quantity is ruining your life right so i don't know what my access needs are necessarily but i'm in situations that either work for me or they don't work for me and when they don't work for me um you know when someone for example has this frame of, of access I, I, my access needs were not met. It's not like, because, because I think sometimes if we don't explicitly name that, that bi-directional relationship, that interaction of environment and person, the idea of this is about a goodness of fit for that person in different environments with different people, people like that, if that frame was not explicitly named for many brains, they don't have it. And so they go, they move through the world thinking that there is, there, they, I mean, they really are told explicitly i mean a lot of implicit but explicitly like this is how we do the thing this is how you apply for a job this is how you interview like this is how you show up this is how you sit still in your classroom this is how you line up in kindergarten like it's one way um as opposed to this like the idea we talk a lot about at brain club about the double empathy problem um where you know like it, it's not that there's like one correct way to communicate it's about it's 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 this relationship of pers you know this mismatch of perspective taking way of seeing the world communication style and like that's where the breakdowns happen i think it's very important to recognize that it's okay for it not to be the right fit and applies to really everything that that you know so it can apply to work relationships it can you know friendships romantic partnerships it's like it's everything it's it's okay especially because pe as people change over the course of their life they need different things exactly i think it's less about can i do the job did i do the job was i good at the job and more about the fit which is half you and half the context and and how you're supported in it yeah and because a person changes over time 
organizations change over time too and that like divergence is okay and i think that then like we bring in elements of you know of abandonment and like attachment issues that come into work and and um you know rejection sensitive dysphoria i need to tell my employer that it's time for me to go oh you know like how dare you you know just like all, all this stuff that really then someone goes off into their world and these these experiences i think stay in people's nervous systems and they go into even healthy work environments and they really have trauma physiology i think that if you're looking for a job if you're in a current job and you're not happy somehow you need to find your voice even if you need someone to advocate for you to step in and say hey you know, can you use the language that I need for my employer so they understand what I need? Because people don't need to be getting fired because they're standing up for themselves. I certainly think that there's ways that employers can be sensitive to a variety of stressors and sort of, you know, do this universal design thing, but it still doesn't get away from the power imbalance. There are people who they they are working but they're being harmed like actively harmed at their places of employment um and they you know it's like it's it's like a a, a privilege to be able to say like i'm gonna look at what do i want to do with my life like the idea of vision casting is like such a higher level brain thing when you're like in the trenches trying to survive um and and anyway i i really would love to figure out and maybe it's about partnering with other organizations, like All Brains Belong as like a little startup nonprofit, like we can't hire all of our patients to do stuff and like make enough money to support themselves enough to leave the terrible jobs where they're, you know, um, they're being discriminated against and traumatized all day long. Out of that, but I think it comes with relationships. It's about how can we collaborate? How can we figure out where are the points that we really meet together, right? Where is those intersectionalities that we can support each other? Where are those crossovers? And it's about it's about brainstorming, right? No pun intended, like of like really coming together, having that think tank to come together to see to see more of what's possible because exactly what you said is like now we're not paying Anna anymore those that money is coming from a variety of other different places and that's what we can do is we can leverage our relationships and connections with the resources that all of us have when we come together and we're really willing to make that commitment to each other so I think that's what's most important. First off, thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, such wisdom there. I want to um, scroll up to a comment in the chat. Um, Taylor says, this idea of redefining what constitutes important or real work has really helped me to get to a better place mentally. I think a lot of people have been damaged by the idea that the amount of money you make determines if you should be okay with the work you're doing. Obviously, we need to be able to afford to live and beyond that, um, one's happiness and health need to be put at the forefront. And I want to combine that with what Chris just said. I like, I merged those ideas in my head about like being in the trenches and faced with so many decisions about what to financially prioritize food or meds or you know anything else. Um, all of that, just all of that, it's so complicated. Um, what's standing out for others? I really enjoyed what Summer was saying about um, kind of just like being able to look at what you love doing, even if it's not something that you've ever thought about as being connected to employment. And, you know, that's when I was saying, it kind of reminds me of how we talk about a culture of interdependence, like what are the things that we love to do that give us dopamine that um, tap into our natural strengths? And sometimes it's hard to recognize those if we've grown up in sort of this traditional capitalistic society 
um, being able to step out of that framework can be challenging, but I think that's a helpful perspective to just kind of like zoom out and look at what do we love to do? What did you love to do when you were 10 years old, you know, and really think kind of before all the social conditioning, you know, really tapping into what gives us joy. Right. And I think when you're in the trenches, struggling to have basic needs met, like the idea of like vision casting or like even remembering what it was to be regulated and what you did to make that happen, like it, that seems so far out of reach for so many people. Monique? Hi, everyone. Monique here. Um, kind of uh, leaping off of what Sarah just said about finding joy in those sparks. And I, um, I'm in my late 50s. And uh, so when I was starting out uh, to find work, um, I, I didn't know that I was autistic and I didn't have those terms. And I, my parents are both... Uh, they both have their own interesting brains. And I appreciate the way that they raised me. My dad was a carpenter and he built these, he would spend two or three years, years building these fantastic houses. And they were all custom built and they were weird and they were wonky. And he was essentially just continuing to build forts throughout his life. It was just an extension of childhood. And I worked with him when I was in my teens, I would go to work with him and he instilled in me the principle to find work that I loved. Then it wouldn't be labor. Like it would, it would pay the bills and probably give me more because I would enjoy doing it. So I would do it well and I would excel at it. And people would see my inspiration, my fire, my passion about it. So I'm really glad that he instilled that in me. And they never judged me for anything that I chose to do for work. And then uh in thinking about this upcoming, this week's topic, I was thinking about work that I've enjoyed over the years. And I worked as a barista at a coffee shop and I, at Starbucks, I'll name it. And it was in the early nineties, late eighties, early nineties, up into the mid nineties. And I loved it. And because it was, it was predictable. It was clear what the expectations were, were clear. There was a procedure manual back in the staff room. Like everything was uh, was laid out and it was clear and it was fun and we got to listen to music and I got to interact with people for a couple of minutes and then they would go away which was awesome and uh, it just like it it lit me up in so many different ways and um, I eventually became a counselor and I was a counselor for many decades and uh, I remember to get certified I had to have a supervisor and I was constantly being um what's the word I'm looking for, uh, reprimanded by my supervisor because I would share too much. She told me that I was too relational in, in the counseling sessions. And now I understand that as double empathy. But at the time I didn't have the converse, I didn't have the terminology or the understanding for it. So just, just last week I ran into her. She's a neighbor of mine. She was my supervisor for 20, 23 years. And I ran into her and I, Actually, we had a good conversation about uh, neurodivergence and specifically, specifically autism and how the way that I was engaging with the people that I was in a counseling relationship with was relational because that was how I relate to people. That was double empathy at play. And um, it was a good conversation. But I just I'm just looking back over the work that I've done. It's, it's interesting to see how I. I made it work for me and it may not have been traditional and it may not have looked the way that other people were doing it, but it was the way that I could do it. And it was fulfilling to me and it was fulfilling to the people who came into my work. Okay. Check. I love that Monique. And I, I think so often, right. Um, and I, I, I know I often quote um, this at brain club, but um, we have one of our community members who, who said, access needs. I don't know what my access needs are. I just know that they're not being met. And I think um, when we look back, you know, even if we don't have the language or the lens of access needs, when you think back to a time where something worked, often that is reflecting that 
you had access needs that were being met. You, you didn't know at the time that's what this was. But now that Monique is like giving this example of like, well, the, I knew exactly what to expect. And the manual was down there. And I had these very like, you know, these brief interactions. Um, wow. Well, like, anyway, um, th now that all makes sense. Um, and I think when people are in situations that really don't work, um, that can be a clue of unmet access needs. Chris? Yeah, I I just wanted to talk a bit about um, how it's been really hard for me, like personally, and I feel like it's related to my neurodivergence to kind of understand the value of money and to to measure it appropriately. It doesn't matter how good I am at like math. I just like don't manage it well. And the, the thing is, like, there, there's not enough. That's the problem. Right. Um, but I I grew up talking about like the the narratives that we grow up with. I think I grew up with uh, what is kind of doesn't make sense why it's a Christian <laughs> narrative, but a Christian narrative of like, if if you're poor, it's because you have like a lesson to learn about specifically managing money and, you know, earning money and being responsible. Um, and so it, it's really hard for me still uh, at 31 to like confront that narrative within myself. It doesn't matter how much I boo capitalism and like my idea. I would do I still have that, that voice telling me that like, if I, if I'm having to make choices between you know, meds or food or appointments, then it's because I'm doing something wrong. Um, and that's, you know, what the most insidious and difficult uh, first step we have to take, I think, in in shifting the narrative um, around work to something more healthy. Um, this is just confronting that that self-blame and realizing that we're, we're being forced to make these decisions in a really <laughs> unjust way. And it's, it's that our faults if we make the wrong decision or, um, you know, are stressed out by the fact that we, that we have to choose. Thank you so much for naming that and sharing that you, you are not alone. And, and the, the way that you were able to articulate that I think has, has likely given so much to so many people here today. You know, I think what the, the idea that, systems these like these oppressive power systems that tell you like that, that 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 thwart you and hurt you and teach you that it's your fault that's really messed up um and before i, I call on ginger the other thing that's coming up for me and um uh, a, a bunch of us on our team here just read um dr devin price's new book on learning shame it's going to be our book chat for march I'm going to read this one sentence. Systemic shame is the socially engineered self-loathing that says we are solely to blame for our circumstances. It tells us that poverty is remedied by the hardworking people pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, that marginalized people are personally responsible for solving the problem of their own oppression. I mean, like the whole book is like that. Um, like it, it's so much what you just said. Ginger. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. So um, thank you so much for doing this. It's been a really rich and um, provocative and exciting conversation. And thanks for everything everybody's, Chris and others and Monique have shared um, so what I'm curious about, and it could probably be a whole separate Zoom uh, brain club, is in jobs that come with insurance, because I have other conditions that require that I have a lot of really expensive medical treatments, and um, I find that a lot of the jobs in large organizations that would have good insurance, excuse me, really feel like the square peg in the round hole a lot of the time. So I'm just, I'm, I'm 
I'm curious about how folks here or from ADB have addressed that. Yeah, you know, it's really common. And, 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 and I think um, one of the it was a, it was a it was a very minor point um, that, that Connie Beale said in, in, in her interview, when she spoke about the benefits cliff, the idea of like, even even when you work in a in a, you know, you get this job, and it like earns slightly more money. And you're like, Oh, yeah, now I can afford the thing. But now that just disqualified me. Now I'm getting kicked off Medicaid, which is one of the, you know, it's the, one of the best insurances you can get. Um, and so it's, it's, um, it's, it's really messed up. Um, and so I think that, um, and we're, we're uh, pretty much everyone who was interviewed for this, this spring club had so much more wisdom than we were able to fit. And so we're already working on like the, I think, I think almost everyone on tonight's panel is on March's panel um, because it's like the continuation of, of, the, of their interviews. And um, this topic comes up um, in in the March discussion around like, what would it look like to center what people really need to get out of work? Um, because I think I I I I think that um, and and maybe it really I mean it 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 really the idea that someone would have to be in an in an environment that hurts their health in order to access healthcare. Um, I was that person, um, so I get it. Um, and it's 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 not sustainable. Oh, Nicole, go for it. Hi, sorry, I couldn't. I Zoom at some point moved that raise hand and I can never remember where it is. Um, first. <laughs> but at least I can raise my hand and then something automatically flashes up. So thanks. <laughs> um, so this has been a really interesting and rich discussion. I really appreciate everybody's contributions to it. I've been thinking about this from the perspective of like, the alternative of kind of working for yourself, right? Like if I can't fit into the round hole, then the, there is an there is an alternative where I become an entrepreneur or a solopreneur and I kind of lead my own thing, but that comes with a slew of other things, right? Because it goes from being in an overly structured and rigid environment to being in an overly unstructured <laughs> environment, which, I don't know. I don't really understand what my access needs are, but I know they're not fully being met by me in my home. So I'm just curious, like, I know we're, we don't have much time left, but I'd be curious to hear more about that in March if I don't know if that's on the agenda. Yeah, totally. So, you know, because I, I, I think one of the, like, you have to couple that topic with the idea of unlearning independence, like the myth of independence, like in a, in a culture of interdependence, the idea that it is completely normal and, and favorable to be connected to and rely on other people. I think that's how the entrepreneur has a shot at figuring out how to meet their access needs because like it, it's completely impossible. Like it's just, it, it, it's so much this. Um, Summer, Summer said yes. You wanna, do you wanna, can you speak to that at all, Summer? I can, sorry, I was eating. Um, <clears throat> I was writing at the same time that it is a collaborative process. And if you try to do it alone, I don't think it's very successful. Um, I've owned my business with my husband for 10, almost 11 years, and we had a slew of people come through our lives, whether it was family or outsiders, that really gave us a lot of wisdom, um, and it was really helpful for us to have that support and I don't think back then we realized what was happening but now in hindsight and I'm looking at the whole picture um, because I used to think that I was really 
introverted and I was afraid of people because I would have so much anxiety about what they thought about me and what I was going to say. And now I'm really past most of that. And I think a lot of us have something inside us that we don't realize, but if you can get around people that can inspire you, that can help lift you up, I think being an entrepreneur is feasible, but you have to plan it, you have to pace it, um, and it's a lot of work and determination, and it's like you have to figure it out. Do I put all this in an employer that doesn't give me everything I want, or do I put all this energy in something that maybe I could get someone else to join me, or I can get investors, or I can get family, or, you know, there's all kinds of different ideas, um, but you have to look at all the different avenues, and I'm someone that just tries everything, and then if I can't get there, I'm like, okay, this is a sign I should just give up, but I will try to exhaust everything I can possibly think of, um, and if you have that determination, you know, and you ask the questions, I think that you might find you can do this. Thank you, Summer. And I think the other the other piece, um, and I, I I definitely want to make sure I read Taylor's comment. I think that's really powerful. I, I'll keep my comment short so I can go to your comment. Um, but I think that when when someone's in the sh in the trenches in the struggle, it is so difficult to even begin to do the like setting up of what Summer just described. So it's like, it it's it it's hard to like, you're, so you're in this cycle and we heard a lot about cycles during our panelist interviews. Like you're in this cycle and it becomes familiar. And so you stay there because there's not the spaciousness. Um, and so it's like, it's like, how do, how do I create, how do I create space bandwidth to be able to plan out those next steps and what could that look like? As Taylor says, I think, I think a problem that can also come with the default of quote, just be your own boss is that nothing gets fixed. Um, why fix the system for those who want to work for someone else? How do you balance it? Yeah. And I think um, uh, that's, that's, it's a really good setup um, for our, our um, March brain club theme um, of systems change from the bottom up. Um, the idea of a village of people coming together um, to really um, not just make things better for themselves, but also um, build like, I mean, like a parallel play kind of universe um, where people can be connected and figure out how employment can, can, can come out of that um, so that people don't need to be in conditions that are hurting them and are destroying their health. It's hard work. Um, and, and I think we can do it in community. So thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being part of our community. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week for our book chat on the book Together by Dr. Murphy, the former Surgeon General, U.S. Surgeon General, about the, um, the, the, the power and the impact of social connection on health. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Bye.